Dear students, today we will be dealing with the topic scanning electron microscope and I have divided the whole uh, scanning electron microscope into two parts. This is because before knowing about the scanning electron microscope, we have to learn about the light microscope or optical microscope. Uh, this is because the principle, fundamental principle on the basis of which images are formed in both optical microscope as well as scanning electron microscopes are same and that is why a thorough understanding of those optical microscopes how it functions how uh, light waves are refracted reflected diffracted or interference uh, takes place only that uh, uh, analysis can help us to find out how a scanning electron microscope works so uh, before going to the scanning electron microscope part though it's a uh, very sophisticated technique this particular scanning electron microscope is used for observation of specimen surfaces and this uh, has a resolution power or the clarity of the image with the same electron microscope is so high that in most cases the light microscope or the optical microscopes are uh, i mean a kind of neglected ones uh, because the uh, because of the high resolution that we have uh, with the scanning electron microscope actually this uh, same or scanning electron microscope is a versatile advanced instrument which is largely employed to observe the surface phenomena of the material and the sample and the study is shot in a sem using very very high energy electron and when uh, in sem we use electron after colliding with the surface of the sample uh, which we want to study these uh, electrons will be scattered and uh, this scattered electrons or the outcoming electrons and uh, sometimes x-rays are also generated due to collision of the uh, scanning electron with the surface electron uh, sometimes x-rays are also generated and all these phenomena of uh, electron release or x-ray uh, generation gives us information about topography morphology composition orientation of grains crystallographic information etc of a particular uh, material so morphology by morphology we mean the shape as well as the size while the topography indicates the surface feature of an object that means how it looks its texture its smoothness or the roughness likewise uh, by composition if we want to find out the composition of a particular material through scanning electron microscope that's, then we mean that we want to know the elements or compounds that constitute that particular material while if we want to learn about the crystallographic data then that means the how the uh, atoms of the constituent element or compounds are arranged within the material and that is why we can say that same is the leading apparatus the scanning electron microscope is the leading apparatus that is capable of achieving a detailed visual image of a particle uh, with high quality and spatial resolution of about 1 nanometer magnification of this kind of uh, apparatus actually can extend up to 3 lakhs so uh, sam is used just to visualize the surface image of a material and doesn't give any internal information it only gives us detailed analysis of the surface of a material because we know that the surface characteristics ultimately help us to know how a particular element or um, compound can participate in a chemical reaction so uh, the in here i have shown three different uh, same images the first one is the three dimensional arrangement of the pollen grains the second one is that of a kidney stone and the third is the stomata present in a leaf so here as the name suggests we use uh, utilize electron as a probe or electron as a medium to learn about the surface topography or surface morphology while in light microscope actually we use light so the basic difference between these two will be in one uses light as a probe and the scanning electron microscope uses uh, electron as a probe now the question is why we need a microscope this is because our uh, human eyes are not made in that way that we can see some objects of 
uh, below certain particular size level. The human eyes have some limit and are able to resolve two points that are 0.2 millimeter apart from each other. This is called the resolution power of the human eye. However, by the addition of lens or group of lenses, just like I am using these packs with a a particular lens these with the help of these lenses uh, two or three lenses we can uh, aid the eyesight and the human eye is then enabled for high resolution and can resolve uh, the two dots that are close to 0.1 or 0.1 or 0.2 millimeter from each other so anything below 0.1 or 0.2 millimeter requires some sort of magnification and therefore to overcome these limitations of human eyesight, the microscope was developed and used as an efficient magnifying tool. So microscope has much higher resolution and has been used as a powerful tool for studying as well as characterizing a wide range of materials. Thus, we can say that a microscope is an instrument that actually magnifies an object and that is why a magnifying glass is the simplest microscope that we can have. But uh, in order to have a higher magnification, we can combine more than one lens. And in that particular case, if we add go on adding uh, lenses uh, in a certain way, we can uh, have the magnification to such a level that very small objects can also be beautifully uh, seen uh, with a very very high resolution that means we can differentiate between any two points which are uh, less than 0.1 millimeter apart so uh, if we have a uh, thorough knowledge about the light microscope as i said because ultimately light will be used as a probe and it will undergo certain kind of changes when it collides with the surface of a particular material and then after that collision we gather the information of the reflected or the refracted rays and that ultimately helps us to form an image and we get the idea of how the object may look like. Now uh, the magnification of a particular microscope if it has more than one lens can be obtained the final magnification can be obtained by uh, simply the product of the individual lenses we are using uh, we can name them as objective lens or ocular lens whatever be the name given actually the main uh, principle is that more the number of lenses more will be individual uh, magnifying quality and the final magnification will be the product of the individual magnetic moment or magnetic uh, I mean the magnification power of the lenses now uh, why we are uh, taking light as a probe of matter uh, I mean light as a probe of image formation first and foremost what is light we know that light is an agent which helps us to see an object when we see the properties of light then we know that light travels in a straight line light casts shadows light is associated with uh, heat with it and when we say what are the characteristic phenomena that a light executes then there will be reflection refraction interference as well as diffraction now the first two properties that is reflection and refraction indicates the vertical character of light while the diffraction and interference are the wave character of light and that is why the corpuscular theory states us that light photons behaves as particle and light photons also move in the form of a wave now diffraction is actually the bending of light now bending is a property that is associated with actually fluid or liquid similarly interference is the addition of something now two cricket ball if we combine them will not give us a football but two glasses of water if we add we will get a larger volume of water so interference means on the addition of something and diffraction means bending of something so light having all these properties of reflection refraction interference and diffraction so when we uh, have all these properties with the light and then light that light falls on a particular substance immediately all these phenomena will take place a portion will be reflected a portion will be refracted some will be diffracted and there will be ultimately interference that means addition reflected and refracted as well as diffracted refracted light when they actually meet at a point 
we will get an image. So the theory behind the image formation is that there must be total meeting of either refracted or reflected light. They may meet really to give us a real image or they may can be made to meet virtually and then they will give us the virtual image. So ultimately it is the diffraction or bending of light when it falls on a particular substance or when it uh, reacts with a particular substance and the addition of the diffracted ray that will give us the image. More the diffraction, more will be splitting, more will be scattering, more will be interferences and then more clear image will be formed. Now what will lead to this diffraction? How we can get a diffracted ray? This ultimately determines the quality of the microscope we are uh, using. Now a microscope contains lens and whenever we have lenses on the basis of the type of lens we are taking we will have different kind of uh, diffraction as well as interference. Now let us consider a glass uh, sphere and uh, this will have a center and let us cut a piece from this uh, sphere and another piece from another uh, sphere. So suppose we have this portion cut portion and then this will be its center and for this curved face this will be called a focal point. And if now I add the second uh, half to it and for this, this, there will be a particular um, center and that will be the focal point for this particular uh, side. Now, uh, when we uh, add actually, this is a sphere, not a circle. This is a sphere and when we add this two cut portion, we may have a double convex lens. So, uh, depending on how we combine this cut portion, suppose I have this cup surface and I block it with a plane mirror then we will be having this plano convex uh, lenses and if I have this portion and I uh, take it in such a way that the, both the uh, parts uh, opposes one another then we will be having the double convex uh, lens. So lens is actually a clear carved piece of material, uh, mostly that material is made up of glass and that are used actually to bend the range of light to form an image. Now to bend the um, uh, ray of light means to diffract light to form an image. So ultimately image formation by a simple lens is nothing but the diffraction of light that falls on it that falls on the glass uh, lens and ultimately that bending will give rise to image formation. Now image formation actually follows certain rules. Suppose I have this particular lens which of uh, may be of any kind and if I have an object here in front of the lens and then from the uh, object there will be this will be the uh, object size and from this object there will be a number of rays passing through it uh, to, and it will fall on the lens and then after getting refracted it will pass out of the lens and there are certain rules that some rays which pass through the origin or the center will go uh, undeviated. Any ray going through the origin will go undeviated any ray parallel to this particular principal axis, this is the principal axis, any ray parallel to the principal axis will go through the rear focal point, that means the center for this, kind, this side of lens. Any ray uh, passing through the, um, I mean center and this ray passing parallel to this will really meet at this point. The number of rays going in this way will meet at this point and we will have the image of an object. Here the image is in the inverted uh, state but st still this image is uh, enlarged that means uh, magnified. The, this was the original size of the object and this is the final size of the image. And that we will see an op uh, image which is real that means the refracted rays are actually meeting at a point giving us a true image though it is inverted. There are certain rules which are followed in the um, ray tracing for a simple lens that means uh, through the origin if the ray passes uh, then it will not be de uh, deviated. A ray parallel to the optical axis will 
go through the near focal point etc and all these rules ultimately will give us uh, the required image we are uh, wanting to have so a ray passing through the origin and there we Ultimately, it is the diffraction and interference which are of tremendous importance in image formation. Now, diffraction and interference in light microscopes are the key principle that determine how a microscope forms an image. So, as I said, uh, diffraction is the bending of light and interference is the uh, addition of light. So, if light falls on a particular object and depending on the angle of incident that means on how it falls on the particular sur surface the surface will definitely bend or uh, reflect or refract the particular rays and if we have we can collect the refracted diffracted or interfered uh, rays then ultimately by adding them up we can have the final image of a particular substance so whenever a particle falls on a particular surface then there will be obviously scattering so that scattering of light that means uh, spreading in all the direction which is called the diffraction and its recombination that means the uh, interference ultimately are the uh, principal physical phenomena behind the formation of an image so uh, there can be different ways by which the light or the rays incident on a particular uh, surface suppose if we allow light to go through a point slit if we allow light to go through a slit and then fall on a particular lens then by determining the size of the slit we can uh, determine how many rays will pass through it if we narrow the ray i mean narrow the slit the beam will ultimately convert to a ray and if we keep on uh, decreasing the size of the slit if we keep on decreasing the size of the slit ultimately a new property develops then the ray instead of going straight it will try to uh, diffract in different direction and then ultimately instead of having a sharp beam colliding at a particular point we will be having a number of scattered rays falling on the particular uh, i mean lens and that uh, determines the image formation for example if we say we have uh, these two rays uh, going and falling on a particular lens without any slitting simply they are allowed uh, with a broad slit they are allowed to fall on a lens then we will have a sharp image of an object it will be a point image but the same ray if we allow to pass through certain slits there is a very possibility that the ray will be diffracted that means they, that will be scattered in a beam uh, there will be a number of rays a number of rays combined to give us a beam so in a beam we may not or we cannot uh, control how the rays will or the beam will go but if we have a single ray then it will be free enough to have a free movement and that free movement ultimately helps it to bend in the way uh, the uh, in a way it wants to bend so uh, through a slit if we allow it to pass then we see that there will be uh, instead of two there will be four refracted rays and we will be having uh, the image not at all a point image if the number of slits are increased number of bending will get increased and the image will be magnified and somehow if we keep on increasing the number of slits there will be vast number of ref, uh, diffracted rays and that refracted rays will give us an image of uh, infinite i would say a much enlarged um, image that the resolution power will also increase tremendously so uh, depending on what kind of slit we are using uh, we can actually have if depending on the uh, uh, slit uh, number of slit we are using we can have different type of i mean the diffraction for example these uh, if i say that uh, if we have a broad uh, slit 
the slit um, weight is broad slit then we have this straight uh, i mean uh, uh, passes of the rays and they are actually called the zero order uh, refraction rays they will give a kind of image but however if we in, uh, decrease the slit size there may be first diffraction of this kind a slitting or diffraction or bending to give us the first order uh, reflected rays if the slit is further decreased then they will give rise to second order third order and th this will go on increasing to give us more and more and more diffracted rays so depending on what kind of slit we are using and depending on what kind of light we are using they will undergo bending so simply we have to understand that if we use a beam of light then we can convert that beam that beam to a ray of light by by allowing the beam to pass through a slit through the slit we just we can filter out the other rays and we can have one or more rays to go straight but again if we go keep on uh, decreasing the slit size we can now control the ray to bend and depending on how the ray bends it will have different type of refractions and that refractions will give us a number of actual meeting point of the refracted rays and more the number of a meeting point of the refracted rays more stronger rays will be formed and these phenomena actually this was first uh, give, given by abbe and, uh, and that is why this uh, whole a thing is uh, now studied as Abbe's principle. So the Abbe theory of image formation in the microscope involves the phenomena of diffraction and interference. So geometrical optic makes use of the concept of ray of light. Actually, we deal with beam of light. When beam of light allowed to is allowed to pass through a slit, then only we can convert it to from beam to a ray. So, if a point source of light, more accurately, a coherent illumination system illuminates an opaque screen with a circular hole and observation scene placed behind the hole will show a bright circular image of the hole. So, if we allow the light to pass through a bigger hole, we will get a circular image. But as the hole diameter reaches a dimension smaller than 0.1 millimeter that means if we keep on decreasing the slit diameter the image assumes a complex pattern then instead of a straight reflected ray we will be having diffracted ray or banded rays and that banded rays will ultimately give us some diffraction rings uh, the undeviated uh, rays we will name them as zero deviated or zero at order then a slightly uh, diffracted with a certain angle we form the first order diffracted ray, rays second order diffracted rays third order diffracted rays and between this diffracted rays there will be a dark space so you will be having some constant um, uh, constant uh, concentric ring circles or rings uh, uh, or which are called actually the uh, fringes we we can have a image which is much more complex than simple a uh, simple circular hole and uh, just uh, th this is the way where we allow the light to pass through a slit then it will be instead of the straight lines now you will be having a diffracted light so what we can say if we have a specimen and it contains different the surface if we have a specimen and the surface contains different type of atoms suppose the black spots one and the bigger holes one then they will uh, uh, react with the diffracted ray in different way on depending on that how they react they will diffract the ray in a different way so the bigger ones will diffract in a different way the smaller uh, black spots will diffract them in a different way and how the incident ray are diffracted that will ultimately that information that means these rays are diffracted in this or that way these informations are collected by the recorder and according to that we will be having the image form 
thus for the zeroth order we will have this bright spots and then according to first order second order third order we have this concentric rings and uh, the maximum light will obviously uh, we get from the zeroth order and according to them uh, the amount of light diffracted we can have this uh, pattern that mean which will show us that how diffraction and what amount of diffraction has been taken place so there are uh, uh, obviously certain rules and the abyss theory is uh, of image formation in microscope mm. is utilized and that is uh, actually followed both in optical as well as in uh, electron microscope so if uh, this light is allowed to pass through slits slits are actually called grating uh, 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 allowed to pass through the slits then according to this will give us refracted beam and the diffracted beam and according to the lens position object position um, and the uh, type of lens use number of lens use we will be having the real image formed uh, and which will be obviously larger in size as well as the resolution power will be very very high now where the object is uh, put whether it is uh, present in the focal point whether it is um, 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 away from the focal point depending on the uh, object position the image formation will also be different so uh, what we can say that a certain amount of incident light doesn't react with the specimen and is transmitted as undeviated non-diffracted rays they will form the central zero eight order diffraction point that means they are not at all deviated they go straight and hit the uh, recorder or hit the screen and they will form the zero order but each ruling in the grating each slit in the grating acts as an independent source of diffracted ray. when the, whether there is a slit there we, we will be having the diffraction so more the number of slits more will be diffraction and depending on the uh, number of uh, slits used we will have the quality of the image form so image formation in the image plane is due to interference that means when all the diffracted rays uh, come out from the lens they will ultimately recombine or combine uh, to give us the image so that is called addition of the diffracted rays and that is none other than the interference so uh, the in, in the image uh, plane the inter interference will take place uh, amongst the uh, undeviated and deviated component now they will rejoin and the interface uh, interfere in the image plane causing resultant wave in the image formation which will be very in amplitude and um, generate contrast and these contrasts are um, monitored actually and there are sensors which can beautifully uh, take out the information of the reflected refracted diffracted and interfering rays and gives us the final image so as i say that depending on the number of slits and depending on the slits the number of meeting point will be more and number of meeting point when it increases obviously we will have a clear and bigger image so uh, these are the things uh, where a light passing through two different slits will uh, be reflected and ultimately we will be getting uh, the image diffracted source the slits are shown here imperfect if this is called resolution the two points if they are close enough that a naked eye cannot uh, find out then the light and the electron microscope can very beautifully differentiate these two otherwise we will see them as one so more the number of slits the particular equation is followed this is a complex mathematical equation which will give us the energy or the um, um, uh, diffraction in multiple plans but ultimately this is the central maxima for the zero order uh, and ultimately uh, because of this different type of slits in the grating we will be having diffracted or banded light uh, under banded rays and that banded rays will uh, combine after reflection through the lens will combine uh, to give us a real uh, image which will have much much higher uh, resolution uh, I mean uh, enlarged form and which will be much clearer image uh, to see which is otherwise not possible through the naked eye.
Dear students, after knowing about uh, the interference and diffraction uh, of light in optical microscope in part 1, we will now study about the scanning electron microscope in part 2. So, SAM is a virtual advanced instrument which is largely uh, used or employed to observe the surface phenomena of a material. Uh, the sample which we want to study in SAM is actually shot or uh, attacked using high energy electron and the outcoming electron and the x-rays thus produced are analyzed. We know that electrons are material particles so whenever they will collide with a surface obviously they will be scattered and the scattered electrons from the uh, object surface will give us enough information to be uh, used later to characterize that particular substance. Now the uh, scattered or the outcoming electron and the x-rays does give information about topography, about morphology, about composition, about orientation of grains, crystallographic information etc. of the substance under study. And by morphology, uh, we mean that it will indicate as the shape and the size, while topography indicates the surface feature of the uh, object under study, that means how it looks, its texture, its smoothness or roughness. Likewise, uh, composition means elements and compounds that constitute that particular material under study. And uh, the crystallographic means the arrangement of atoms in that particular material. Thus, we can say that the SAM is the leading apparatus that is capable of achieving a detailed visual image of a particle with high quality and spatial resolution of about 1 nanometer. And this resolution can go or mean magnification can be, uh, can extend up to 3 lakhs time. So, uh, SAM is used just to visualize the surface image of a material and it doesn't give any internal information but still it is considered as a powerful instrument because that can be used in characterizing crystallographic, magnetic, electrical feature of the sample and it determining in determining if any morphological changes of the particle has occurred after mo modifying the substance or the sample. Uh, surface with other molecule and uh, the next thing is SAM is also and that means the scanning electron microscope is also able to provide several qualitative information of the specimen which includes its topography, morphology, composition, crystallographic information and these uh, will come out in a qualitative way to give the overall uh, property of the substance under study. So, in other words, it provides information about the surface features, texture, shape, size, arrangement of the particles lying on the sample surface only. It will not go uh, to the depth, I mean the inner um, things are cannot be studied. For that, we have the tunneling electron microscope or TEM, but still though the surface properties are determined with the help of uh, same it's a multi purpose instrument that means it will make us able to examine and analyze the material with very very high resolution that is actually not possible with an optical microscope so uh, in same the basic difference from the optical microscope is that in optical microscope we use light as a probe to uh, study an object to examine an object uh, here, uh, it will be the electron beams or the first moving high energy electrons uh, to analyze the surface of a substance or to have the image of the uh, surface of an object. So, uh, we definitely must have someone or the electron source which can produce electron and that electron beam is allowed to pass through a magnetic field, maybe an electromagnet. Uh, in order to give it the required direction and then it will collide with the substance under study and on collision this electron is a material particle this this uh, the substance it is colliding is also a material particle so definitely there will be a collision amongst them and this uh, collision will ultimately lead to certain phenomena and these signals will be produced according to the uh, type of collision and that collision or the, that uh, uh, signals will be collected by a detector and then it will be monitored on a screen 
that these are the information we gathered when electrons collided with the uh, surface material. Now why electrons are used as we say that both light and the electron have dual character both particle as well as wave character but compared to light electrons have shorter wavelength and being uh, of shorter wavelength they will have will be more energetic so when photons collide the photons of light collide with the surface the energy uh, of exchange the collision they produce will be much smaller than the collision that are produced by electrons high energy electrons because of their shorter wavelength and then due to that collision these the um, signals that we will be getting will be stronger than that in an optical microscope. So uh, the basic uh, setup of same setup where the electron beam and the specimen interacts is that uh, whenever incident beam falls on the sample surface there will be different type of uh, uh, rearrangement of the electrons of the sample and the incident beam electron. First and foremost there may be a sc uh, scattering of the electrons coming from the electron being giving rise to some back scattered electron that means the electron which are coming after collision will uh, scattered with a different uh, velocity and uh, they will be scattered in all the direction and when they are collected by a detector we can term them as back scattered electron there may be cathode luminescence that means th that will give us the electrical information of the luminance occurring there may be emission of electron from the sample itself after collision the in, uh, incoming electron may provide energy to the electron present in the sample so that they uh, uh, can overcome the attractive force of the nucleus and can go out of the sample this will give rise to the secondary electron then there will be auger electrons that means when the secondary electrons are removed some voids or free spaces will be created and to that free space some electrons from some other orbital will come and fill in the uh, fill that gap and on that uh, on that um, uh, occasion there will be formation of auger electron and when a high energy uh, electron from a higher orbital goes to a lower energy orbital obviously there will be emission of extra energy and that will give rise to x-rays so on the um, incident beam colliding with the sample these kind of uh, phenomena may occur creation of backscattered electron secondary electron auger electron as well as x-rays now uh, there may be elastic as well as inelastic scattering of electron now what are secondary electrons actually secondary electrons are electrons in the specimen that are ejected by the beam uh, electron so the incident beam when uh, collides with the surface they will provide their energy to the electron already bound to the specimen and depending on the uh, collision the type of collision whether it is strong or weak there will be energy exchange between the two and if the electrons on the substance under study are loosely bound they will be ejected out and they will give rise to the secondary electron emission now uh, the electron which can be emitted must be weakly bound to the uh, nucleus otherwise the nucleus will hold the electron tightly and then the removal of electron will not be that easy so if the electrons are in the conduction or the valence band that means in the outermost orbital that it doesn't take much energy to eject them and they will form the slow secondary electron with energies typically around 50 electron volt however if the electrons which we want to eject are inner cell electron they will be uh, attracted by the nucleus more tightly and then removal of these electrons will require somewhat higher energy and uh, they will um, must have sufficient amount of beam energy otherwise they cannot be removed or thrown out and they will give rise to the first secondary electrons and if the electrons are ejected from an inner cell by the energy release with an ionized atom returns to the ground state then these secondary electrons are called auger electrons this means we can say that whenever uh, there is a an empty space or vacancy of electron in the inner cell the one electron from the outer cell may go inside by releasing an uh, uh, energy and in that process it will result in the formation of this 
auger electrons. So slow secondary electrons or fast secondary electrons, these electrons when they will be ejected out will be automatically captured by the detector and the detector can tell us from what kind of orbital it is it is ejected and what was its uh, nature or uh, environment uh, in the particular substance from where it has been ejected. Depending on, for example, if an electron is ejected from carbon, it will have a kind of environment. If that electron is ejected from, uh, suppose, a metal called titanium, then it will have a different kind of uh, environment. And the difference in of these energy values and uh, some uh, comparison with some standard data can tell us that these secondary electrons are produced by this particular element and we can get an information whether that particular substance is present or not. So auger electrons, if we say the energy of auger electron is given by the difference between the original excitation energy and the binding energy of the outer cell from which an electron was added, uh, is active. So uh, in the vacuum, this is conduction band and this is, uh, I mean, the valence band. And uh, this is uh, auger electron. That means there is a vacancy. This is the innermost cell. Uh, some um, uh, incoming electron collides with it and that ultimately leads to uh, movement of this electron. That means energy is transferred to that electron and it has gone to the higher level by absorbing energy and then the energy of the electron is such that it can be removed and this position will again be occupied by some electron from the upper level and this will go down and will fulfill this particular orbital. When it goes down, it will release energy in the form of X-rays and when this position, this is knocked down, when this position are occupied by some other uh, uh, electron, that will be uh, also reflected by the energy changes and on the basis of that, we can find out the energy of the electron which will be removed by the uh, orbital or the incident uh, beam. Now, X-rays are related whenever there is a vacancy and some, uh, um, I mean, um, electrons from upper level fulfill that particular orbital, then the, there is an energy difference between two levels. So, this electron, if it wants to come here, it will have to release energy and that energy is uh, emitted as X-rays. So, X-rays will give us an um, uh, uh, information about the ionization energy uh, or the binding energy with which an electron is um, attached to a particular nucleus. Now, uh, the electrons can be easily removed only when they are, uh, they are, uh, they are having some weak binding energy and that makes, the, uh, makes a sense that electrons will be ejected mostly by followed by uh, semiconductor metals are conductors and the semiconductors um, are also having some conducting properties. So generally if we uh, employ a particular element which is of conducting nature, the, in that case only uh, the proper image formation is possible and proper resolution and highly analyzed um, true picture of a substance can be seen. These are some of the same images of metal nanoparticles uh, and uh, before I conclude uh, let us discuss about the requirements actually some requirements are needed when operating uh, SAM analyst mm -hmm. analysis actually and additionally when using SAM uh, the sample have to be electrically conductive to avoid overcharging on the surface and this overcharging may in uh, introduce extreme brightness and poor uh, image actually. So since we are dealing with electrons and if the substance has a little bit of conducting property then the phenomena of scattering takes place very uh, promptly or you can say very um, easily and then the removal of electron whether it is a secondary electron or a backscattered electron or removal of uh, I mean emission of x-rays all this becomes uh, an easy process and in that case we can have a very uh, uh, high resolution image otherwise if the substance is not conducting we have to coat it with a conducting material and then only we can have the uh, scattering in a better way to have a high resolution same image 
the non-conducting materials must be spattered uh, they must be uh, layered in order to reduce the charging problem with a conducting material actually and after that the sample covering uh, uh, apparatus in the same will be uh, fixed in such a way that the light, uh, electron beam falls on it uh, uh, and interact first with the conducting material and then it reaches the non-conducting material to give us the image of the uh, I mean the substance under study. Uh, the same instrument is uh, based on the principle that the primary electrons are released from a source. They provide energy to the atomic electrons of the specimen which can then release as the secondary electron and then uh, image can be formed by collecting this secondary electron from each point of the specimen. I repeat from each point of the specimen that means the surface where the primary electron fall immediately interacts with the electron atmosphere there and they release to the uh, removal of secondary electrons and the detector collects all the secondary electrons to get an information about the surface of the material under study. In addition, the primary electrons are produced and emitted from the electron gun are accelerated by heating or applying high energy uh, only to interact in a better way so that uh, they can penetrate to some level uh, from the surface and give us information, a little bit information about the inner structures also. So, uh, same uh, image of different metal uh, particles if we study, we see that uh, for uh, amorphous uh, powder there is no, this, this particular image if we take, there is no distinct a shape uh, that can be uh, seen from this particular uh, same image so we cannot conclude that they follow a definite shape here also we have the same image as well as tam image in the copper containing a nano composite and if the metal is there we will get a black spot of the metal i mean uh, the black spots uh, and if there is a tam then there will be the crystal lattice structures also but in same actually we don't have the inner uh, inner uh, arrangement or inner lattice structure only the shape and size and morphology uh, so but still uh, there is a black spot which may indicate that it uh, it is having the metal atom there and these are some uh, scanning electron micrographs of different type of substances here this is a uh, um, do not regular but of rock type this is also rock type and these are having a particular shape of they appear as a cubical form so depending on the metal we are taking uh, whether it has bcc fcc or um, uh, that kind of um, a close packed structure that can be revealed by the same images. These are spherical nanoparticles, metal nanoparticles, spherical nanoparticles, the same image shows us that they are all of um, equivalent, they are uh, almost identical and of, um, maybe the production uh, methodology gives us some identical uh, metal uh, nanoparticle here also this is a same image but the structure is not regular though they are spherical almost but still there is the regularity is not uh, maintained uh, it is given in the scale of 200 nanometer so this much of length uh, is for 200 nanometer and if we want to uh, find out the individual particle size then from this scale we can find it out there will be this will be 40 or 50 nanometer uh, particles there this is another uh, same image of a metal nanoparticle uh, this is another uh, same image of metal nanoparticle where they are uh, almost of identical spherical shape almost of identical spherical shape and if we get the scale we can find out the uh, sm smallest and the largest uh, I mean the molecule so the same are really useful to give us an information about uh, actually the surface and the texture whether it will be soft whether it will be smooth whether it will be uh, uniform and all these informations we can obtain from these are some noble metal nanoparticle and here we can see that they follow extremely good uh, um, I mean shape and uh, crystal structures actually rather I would say these are octahedral into some extent and these all these are rod shaped these are cuboidal 
and uh, the same image uh, shows us that the, definitely the mechanism or procedure or methodology followed ultimately leads us to some extremely well shaped uniform uh, metal nanoparticles. So SAM is of immense importance if done uh, accurately to give us uh, the size, shape, morphology, texture, crystal crystalline data, crystallographic data, etc. to have a thorough analysis of a thorough characterization of the substance we want to prepare. Ultimately, uh, if we can prepare the particles in nano range, then only its catalytic properties and other properties will be enhanced. And that whether we have prepared it in the nano range and whether we have prepared it uh, uh, the uniform pre that can be done only with the same images.